So good to see you. Uh, thanks for being here today, or thanks for joining us online. Uh, I love seeing crowds growing and growing in our room this morning, and we've also been watching the number of people who are joining us online growing and growing. So uh, thank you so much for that. My name is Steve Wallen. I'm one of the pastors here at Genesis Church. It's my privilege to be back with you today as we continue in our series called Planted. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open that to Exodus chapter 1. Uh, if you've got your phone or your tablet, whatever you read your Bible on, go ahead and get that out. Also, if you're joining us from home, we're going to take communion a uh, little bit later. So if you have a few moments, go get some elements, a cracker, juice, some bread, whatever you have at home will work. If you're in the room, we'll give you some instructions in a few minutes to do that. Before we get going this morning, though, I want to let you know about some staffing changes that are going to be taking place over the weeks to come. And because I know that sounds a little ominous, I want to just make, let you know up front, nobody's quitting, nobody's leaving, nobody's being fired. Uh, but we've been making, thinking uh, through some strategic decisions that we want to make. Uh, and so if you're on the campus email list, you probably got a video from Paul yesterday explaining these changes. But we see a real opportunity right now to help people connect in community here at Genesis Church. I mean, I know that COVID is still here. It's still around. It's still a threat. It will be for a while. But as vaccines get rolled out and more and more people have had COVID and made it through, uh, we see a lot more people coming back to our services, worship services, whether it's here in person or online. But we're coming up on a year of self-isolating. Really, it was mid-March when so much shut down, and we see people desperate to get into community. I mean, some of you are coming back, some of you are joining us online, but what we hear over and over again is, I miss my people, I miss my community. And that's something that I think the church can do better than any other organization, any other business, any other entity in the world is community. Now, pair that with the fact that our numbers are growing, uh, uh, you probably noticed that here. We were growing before quarantine, and we were growing pretty fast, and then we slowed down quite a bit, as every church did, but now we're started to grow again. And uh, it's at a different rate, but we're still growing. And then you think about the vision that we laid out last spring for our Noblesville campus, that we still need a new home for our Noblesville location. That's still a real need. And so here's the bottom line. About uh, three months ago, Paul asked me to pray about leaving Carmel to go become the Noblesville campus pastor. And I told him, no, I wouldn't pray about that. <laughs> uh, but he asked me again, and so I prayed about it. And I think that's the right move uh, for us as a church right now. Uh, I am going to be leaving at the end of this month, Carmel, to go to Noblesville uh, to help uh, camp to be the campus pastor there. I'll be leading the staff, I'll be helping our relocation efforts, and I'll have the opportunity to preach a lot more frequently than I have uh, here recently. Now, many of you know that Ben Krause is the campus pastor there now. Ben isn't going anywhere, but Ben's passion really is for helping people get connected and um, connecting with people in pastoral care and helping people get connected to the ministries of Genesis Church and in groups. And my joining him at Noblesville will free him up to let him do that, to focus on getting people connected in community there. So Ben will become the groups and disciple-making pastor at our Noblesville campus. But we want the same thing here too. We want the same thing for Carmel too. And so as far as a champion for groups and connections, so I'm happy to let you know that Kevin Russell will be coming to Carmel and will be the groups and disciple-making pastor at the Carmel campus, and that will be his sole focus now. Now, there's one more piece of the puzzle I want you to know about. Um, I'm still going to be handling a lot of the same things that I currently do for Genesis. I, some of you know I do the financial statements, HR, payroll, things like that. And a big part of my job, uh, a large part of my ability to get things done is our director of operations, Danielle Baum. And so Danielle is going to stay at the Carmel campus for a while to help us with this transition. We didn't want to throw too much at you at one time, but eventually uh, Danielle is going to be leaving and moving to Noblesville campus as well. And when I've shared this news with the four or five families that I've shared it with over the past week, most of them were sadder about that piece than about me going to Noblesville. So I get it. I understand. We love Danielle. She's great. Well, maybe you're wondering, well, where does that leave Paul? Well, I'm excited to tell you this morning that Paul is taking on the role of Gen Kids leader here at the Carmel campus. That's not true. That's, that's, I just made that up. Uh, Paul is going to continue to function as our lead pastor. He will uh, con continue to function kind of like he has since COVID began, going back and forth between campuses. But you'll get to see Paul a lot more frequently here uh, as well as online. And uh, he'll focus a lot of his effort on leading staff, especially me and Jerry, because quite frankly, Jerry and I take a lot of leadership. <laughs> uh, but uh, one, one last thing, and then I have some preaching to do. Uh, this isn't goodbye. We are one church. Uh, I'll still be back occasionally. My family and I will be here occasionally, not nearly as frequently, but I wanted to say thank you. 
I want to say thank you for your confidence over the past nine years. We've been here almost nine years at the Carmel campus, and that's hard for me to believe. But thank you for your confidence in me. Uh, Thank you for listening to me for nine years. I know that that's not easy, so I want to thank you for that. Thanks for letting me be one of your pastors. It's been the privilege of a lifetime. It hasn't always been easy. Uh, Lord knows we've had some challenges here. And in a lot of ways, I was the least likely person to become a pastor. But I want to let you know that I have every confidence and faith in Jerry Neville as your campus pastor and that you have an incredible staff here with Jerry and Joel in worship and Michael uh, as a student pastor. And uh, I'm just so excited to see who God's going to bring into that team uh, and, uh, and fill these two roles we have. So we've got a couple roles that we have available still now at the Carmel campus, even now. Uh, and that's, we have an, uh, an operations person, an administrative person, and then we have a Gen Kids role. And so if you know anybody, uh, let me know. But like I said, in a lot of ways, I was the least likely person to become a pastor. I didn't grow up in the church. Uh, faith wasn't a priority for my family. There were about three years, um, about three years as a young teen where I got connected to a church. My mom, we uh, grew up with my dad, but we would go visit my mom on weekends. My mom got connected to a church, uh, Church of God Church. And um, we started going for three years, and uh, she made me go to youth group and Sunday school and church, and uh, I got baptized there. I heard the gospel there, um, but we were only there for about three years, and then I got mad at God, and I walked away from that, and I didn't really want anything to do with church. And even later, after I got married and I became a Jesus follower, like, I didn't have any formal background. I was an MBA. An MBA doesn't really help you preach the gospel, right? It's not very helpful in that. It won't make you a good pastor. I used to joke that all my biblical knowledge came from reading the Bible. Uh, that's where it came from. That's how I learned. Now, fortunately for me, fortunately for me, God often uses the least qualified people to accomplish his purposes. Now, don't worry. If you were, if you were valedictorian or salutatorian of your class, if you were homecoming queen or captain of the football team, if you played first chair or had the lead in the school play, uh, God can still use you. Like, God can still use people that are more perfect than we are. It's just that he specializes in using imperfect people to accomplish his perfect purpose. Now, if you've been with us the last three weeks, you've probably noticed that theme throughout the stories we've talked about. You probably noticed that God has a habit of using the least likely people to accomplish his will. We saw that in Abraham and Sarah, where God took an elderly, infertile couple and said, I'm going to build a nation out of you two. And then... Uh, Last week, we learned about a teenager named Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers, and eventually he was thrown into prison, but somehow God elevates him to second in command in Egypt. Uh, Jerry, I think, called him the vice president of Egypt. Imperfect people, perfect purpose. Well, after Joseph died, things gradually got worse for the people of Israel. Uh, They had settled into Egypt. They began to grow in numbers, but the numbers grew so large that when a new ruler came along, the new Pharaoh came along, he began to fear that the Israelites would become too powerful for them and take them over. And so take a look at what happened. Exodus 1 is where we're going to start, verse 8. It says this, Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Now, the first thing you might notice in this is that there's this Pharaoh that comes along and he's heard nothing about Joseph. All the amazing things that we've read about and we've heard about and we know about Joseph, Pharaoh doesn't know any of them. Why? Well, because he was never told. And I think that's such a great reminder for us uh, who are parents, maybe we're teachers, maybe we're aunts and uncles, that you need to tell the kids in your life about God. And not just the stories from the Bible, not just the the stories that we read, but the stories that you've experienced about your life story. Uh, Because if you don't ever tell your kids what God has done in your life, they won't know the good that God has done in your life. But if you tell them, then they'll be able to carry that on. Parents, your kid's faith is going to start with whatever you leave them. You know, just like the church that our kids inherit is going to be the church that we leave them. And so it's so important that we tell them the stories of what God has done in our lives. Because the Pharaoh never heard those stories, the Egyptians come to dread the Israelites. Uh, But the Israelites should have seen this coming because 500 years before that, God told Abraham this was going to happen. 
If you go back to Genesis 15, it says this, then the Lord said to him, said to Abraham, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Now think about this, that Israelites had this in their history, and yet God uses a famine in Joseph's story to bring them into Egypt where they start to grow and gain power, and they gain so much power that the Egyptians enslave them, and that starts the clock on this 400 years. They see this happen. Now, it was certainly hard for the people of Israel to see, but God had a plan in all of this. He had a perfect plan to help draw his people, Israel, back to him. And his perfect plan was unfolding throughout all of Scripture, and his perfect plan is still unfolding today, and that's why we're doing Planted. That's why we're doing this. The challenge is to read through Scripture and teach through the whole Bible in 2021. But as we've said, we don't have time on Sunday mornings to cover every story, uh, every eventuality that you're going to read about. So if you haven't started yet, download the Read Scripture app. Pick up a journal if you're here in the room. They're at the Info Hub. They're free. And and start today on day 24. Today's day 24. It's easy to tell in January what day it is. It gets a little harder later in the year. But today's day 24, and just start reading on day 24. Don't try to get caught up right now. Just start and read along with us. So that's where we left off, all right? So now along comes Moses. Moses is pretty lucky to be alive. I mean, at the time of his birth, what had happened was Pharaoh had decided this, was, this group was growing too powerful, and slavery wasn't really stopping them from reproducing a lot of happy Hebrew homes in uh, Egypt, but that caused the new pharaoh to issue this order, and the order was that every newborn boy would be killed. Every Hebrew boy would be killed. It was genocide. It was a horrible time for the Hebrew people living in Egypt. This is the time that Moses was born into in Egypt. Now, Moses' mother gives birth, and like any mother, she couldn't imagine the thought of her son being killed. So in a desperate move, she hid him for as long as she felt like she could. For three months, she hid him away. And she was a godly woman who trusted in God. We don't know her name. We don't know if she gave Moses a name uh, before he was born. She happened to know that Pharaoh's daughter made it a point to go down to the Nile River every afternoon to bathe. And so in Exodus 2, we see her doing the one thing that she thought she could do to save her son. It says this, Exodus 2, 3. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of a Nile. So she uh, comes up with a scheme to protect her baby. She's going to float this baby over to Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter is indeed bathing in the river and sees this baby floating by. And she picks him up and she names him Moses, which means drawn out because she drew him out of the water. And that name is going to become critical later in Moses's life when God has to draw him out into this leadership role among Israel. And as he grew, some, uh, so Moses was raised in royalty, but as he grew up somewhere along the way, he realized that he was related to these people who were slaves. He was a Hebrew people. That was actually his family, his people. And he started to notice the plight of the Hebrew people in Egypt. They were slaves, but he wasn't. Moses wasn't. He was royalty. And then one day he's out among the people and he watched as this Egyptian slave master started beating a Hebrew worker and Moses interfered and he killed the Egyptian man and one of the Hebrews saw it and Pharaoh heard about it and got really mad and wanted to have Moses killed. He was really angry and so Moses had to run away and he fled to this place called Midian. And so basically Moses goes into hiding for 40 years. The next 40 years of his life are spent in Midian on the run, uh, hiding away from Pharaoh. And to pass the time and to make a living, he becomes a shepherd. Like what a change, like from royalty, from uh, the daughter of a princess to a shepherd, uh, tending sheep in the field. But one day, in a miraculous fashion, God confronts Moses directly. You've heard this story, I'm sure. He comes in the form of a burning bush. It was on fire, but never being consumed. And uh, you're probably familiar with this part. God speaks to Moses out of this burning bush. And this is what he says, Exodus 3, verse 7. He says, the Lord says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I just want to stop right there and just kind of maybe build on what something Alyssa said. If you're down, if you're worried, if you're wondering if God ever sees you in your misery, he sees you. He knows you. He sees the misery of his people in Egypt. He says, I heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down. God has come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. This is the land that he had promised to Abraham years before. 
And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, he says to Moses, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And what follows is a conversation that maybe sounds very similar to one that you've had with God as well. Moses says to God, what, me? Who, who am I? Like, who am I to go? Who, who, who says that Pharaoh's going to listen to me? And God answers, Moses, I will be with you. And Moses says, I, I can't answer their questions. And God says, I'll give you the answers. And God goes on to explain how he has great plans to do great things through Moses. And Moses keeps trying to get out of it. He keeps saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. And God says, you will, you will, you will. God uses these three examples to convince Moses that he is going to be with him. And so first he tells Moses to throw down his staff and it turns into a snake. And then he has Moses pick up the snake and it turns back into his staff. And then next he says, Moses, stick your hand in your cloak. And he does, and he comes out and it's got leprosy all over it. And then he sticks it back in his cloak and it comes out clean. And then the third one is he takes the, the Nile River and Moses goes over and scoops water out of the Nile and he pours it on the ground. And as he does, the water turns to blood. You see what God's doing? He's, he's silencing Moses' objections. He's silencing those arguments that he can't make a difference. Moses, Moses isn't qualified for this task. I mean, he is one guy with a record and a lot of hesitation. What can he do for the people enslaved in Egypt? But one of the reasons I think that God uses the unqualified is because when they succeed, there's no way they can take the credit, right? I mean, if this works, you know, think about what Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, God's power is made perfect in our weakness, and so don't you see, if, if this thing succeeds, there's no way for Moses to take credit. He, he can't talk. There's nothing about his personality or his past or his speaking skills for others to say that he was so qualified. He was clearly the right man for the job. Nobody's going to say that about Moses. He, he begs God to send someone else. He, he plays the stuttering card. He's so full of doubts and questions. He says, I'm no good at that. It's almost like he thinks God's going to call him to something just to fail at it. But remember, God's reputation is on the line here too. I wonder if you've ever felt like Moses. You ever felt like God nudged you to do something and all you want to do is say, God, you've got the wrong person. I'm not your man. I'm not your woman. Or maybe someone suggests that you start something new. You know, take on a new charity, teach in our gin kids ministry, start a new business, lead a connection group, volunteer at your kid's school, share the gospel with your neighbor. And how do we respond? What, me? I, I can't do, who am I? They're not going to listen to me. I, I can't do that. I've got no business doing anything like that. Can I tell you what stops most people from doing the great things that God's called them to? It's fear. And usually it's fear of embarrassment. You know, it's fear of rejection. It's fear of looking like a fool. I want to share something with you that I've learned in the past nine plus years of ministry that may help with that fear. I see in me that God has placed in me certain needs that he's the only one that can meet them. There are certain needs that if, if we try to have those filled by another person or, or stuff or a habit or a hobby, it's going to fail miserably and we will end up frustrated and angry and unfulfilled. And one of those needs is the need for affirmation. And for guys, this is a huge deal. Now, women, ladies, you may struggle with this too. I don't know. I'm not one of you, and so I can't really help you with that. But I know for guys, for men, this is a big deal. We look for affirmation from our fathers, and then from our girlfriends, and then from our wives, and then from our children. And when we don't get affirmation quickly and frequently in a form that speaks to our heart, uh, it can crush our fragile eagle, ego. And ladies, guys have fragile egos. And I've just watched as that desire, that need for affirmation has sent so many men spiraling into alcoholism, drug abuse, pornography, and adultery. Guys, the only way we can overcome the fear of rejection and, is to value God's opinion of us higher than anyone else's opinion of us. It's only to look for affirmation from the one who is qualified to give it to us instead of the opinion of people. When we need other people to affirm our value, our weaknesses become a real problem because the truth is the people that are closest to us are going to notice our weaknesses first. And when they notice our weaknesses, we're worried that 
them viewing our weaknesses. That's a, a threat to our self-esteem. It's a threat to our self-worth. It's a threat to our value. But what if, what if instead of looking at our weaknesses as a problem with ourself, what if we use those as a way to move forward in our relationship with God? God, when I'm weak, I'm going to have to rely on your strength or else this isn't going to happen. What if we changed our opinion of that? What if we changed the way we looked at that? Our biggest barrier to taking the step that God is calling us to take is that we don't see in us what he sees in us. You know, but once we realize that our value is secure in Christ, we'll begin to do things that scare us and we'll do them because we know that when we succeed, he will get the glory and he will get the honor and our self-worth is secure because we only care about what God thinks about us and not what people do. Back to Moses now. We watch as his heart starts to change because he's buoyed from this promise from God. God says, I will be with you. God reminds Moses, hey, you're not in this thing alone. Like, I'm not sending you out there by yourself. And so Moses obeys and he goes before the Pharaoh in Egypt, the guy who's the leader of millions. In fact, he's the leader of millions. Pharaoh's the most powerful man in the world at this time. And Moses is an 80 year old shepherd. And he's standing before the Pharaoh and he says, the Lord says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, uh, that's a no from me. He says, in fact, because you've asked, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let the people go. In fact, I'm going to start working them even harder. If you're an Office fan, remember on The Office when Pam tells Michael to stop dating her mom and Michael says, I'm going to start dating her even harder? That's what Pharaoh does right there. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to work him even harder. And he follows through with that. The conditions get worse and Moses leaves for a while, uh, but he doesn't stop there. He keeps coming back. He begins this series of visits over and over again to Pharaoh and Pharaoh starts this whole series of no's. In fact, later in this exchange, what we see is this. Tell me what you would do if God did this to you. God says to Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh and you're going to tell him to let your people go and he's going to tell you no. Now go. What would you do? <laughs> Moses keeps going and Pharaoh keeps saying no. And so over this period of time, God unleashes a series of curses against the Egyptians, 10 very ugly plagues that start to unfold one at a time. Uh, first, the Nile River turns to blood. Then these frogs come from everywhere and take over the whole country. Uh, then gnats and swarms of flies and then diseased livestock and then boils all over the skin of the Egyptians. Then there were thunderstorms of hail and locusts and frightening darkness. Ten horrific plagues that punished Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. But they weren't just punishment for Egypt. They were also signs to God's people. They were a reminder to Israel that the God of strength was still there. And sometimes we need that reminder, don't we? because we don't always remember that the God of strength is there. Now, each of these catastrophes was also assigned to Pharaoh. Because, see, the Egyptians were a polytheistic culture. That meant that they had lots of gods that they worshipped, okay? And uh, each of these plagues was a specific sign to Pharaoh about one of his so-called gods. So, for example, Pharaoh worshipped a god called Hapi. Hapi was the god of the Nile River. So when the true god turned the Nile River to blood, he was basically saying, hey, Hapi, Hapi your Hapi is not a god. Uh, there was a god, goddess called Heket. Pharaoh and the Egyptians would worship Heket. Uh, she was a fertility goddess with the head of a frog. So when God sent frogs all over the country, he's saying, hey, Heket, Heket's not a real god. And then there was a god, Ra, the sun god. And so when God blocked out the sun and caused total darkness to fall over the land for three days, the god was saying, hey, Ra is not a god. The one true god is the god of the sun. Nine plagues and nothing happened. It wasn't until the 10th plague the one that really broke Pharaoh's heart, that he changed his mind and decided to let the people go. It's the one that hit closest to home. I'll tell you about that 10th plague in just a minute. But after that last plague, Moses goes before Pharaoh and Pharaoh's crushed with tragedy all around him and he finally gives permission to lead his people out of Egypt and they're free and they're on their way to the desert. But sometime after Pharaoh lets them go, he changes his mind. He realizes, oh no, I have just let my entire workforce go. Like everything that we've built our wealth on as a country, as a nation, is leaving towards the promised land. And so it doesn't take long before the Egyptians take off after Moses and the Israelites. Now, in the meantime, Moses has these two to three million people that he's leading out of Egypt. And one day he turns around and he looks behind him to see that Pharaoh and all of his chariots are coming up on their backside. And he turns around to look and in front of him is the Red Sea, this giant body of water. There is nowhere to go. And the Israelites turn to Moses and they say, 
thanks for nothing. Yeah, we were slaves in Egypt, but at least we had our lives. And now we're going to die out here in the wilderness. And I just want you to see what happens. I know Alyssa talked about it earlier. I cut, by the way, I could have just stopped and not come up here. Alyssa already preached the message this morning. So thank you, Alyssa, for that. But uh, the Israelites are saying, hey, we could, we, we're just going to die out here. You do that. Now look what Moses says. He, this man of insecurity and inadequacy responds. This is the guy, remember, that argued with God. We just read that a couple chapters ago. He argued with God that he wasn't the guy to go. The guy that feared public speaking stands up. Two million people in the nation of Israel. And this is what he says, Exodus 14. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see now, those people that are chasing you that you see now, you will never see them again. Listen to the changes in Moses. He's gone from, I can't, I can't, I can't to God can God can do this. Watch as he does this. With a few short months of obedience, he's now able to say, look at what God is going to do in this situation. Now, I got to believe that Moses doesn't know. Like he's standing there in front of the Red Sea. He's got the Egyptians coming behind him. I got to believe he doesn't know what's next, but he says, now watch what God is going to do. Now, I think you know this story. If you've ever gone to Universal Studios, you've seen how they did it in the movies. Uh, Moses stands there and in one of the most famous miracles in the Old Testament, the Lord through Moses parts the Red Sea and the people of Israel pass through on dry land. Did you notice that, that in the, in the, uh, in, in the story in Exodus, it says the people pass through on dry ground, like they didn't walk through the mud, they didn't walk through ankle deep water, that they walk through on dry land. And that tells me that when God makes a miracle, he miracles it all the way, right? It's completely dry. God, uh, the Egyptians start chasing the people of Israel, that God closes the waters back in, the people of Egypt are swallowed up and the entire army of Egypt is destroyed and Israel is saved, all because Moses trusted in God and agreed to do his part. I mean, think about that. That's all God ever asked him to do was his part. God didn't ask him to do everything. He didn't say, you're gonna have to come up with a plan. He didn't say, you're gonna have to be the one that fights off Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He says, I just want you to do your part. You do your part, I'll do my part. You know, today... um, is one of my favorite days of the year because it's the last weekend of the NFL playoffs and um, I love NFL football. And uh, one of my favorite players in the whole league right now is a uh, place for the Colts. His name's Quentin Nelson. I don't know if you guys know about Quentin Nelson, but Nelson's an offensive guard. He was chosen in the 2018 draft in the first round. He was a six player picked overall, which is very rare for his position. Uh, Quentin Nelson plays offensive guard. Now, if you don't know anything about football, what I want you to know is that if you're an offensive guard, if you have a great game, they will never call your name. <laughs> like it's only when you uh, have a holding penalty or you jump off sides or if you give up a sack that they'll ever call your name. But if you have a perfect game and you make every block perfectly, they will never call your name. But now after only two years, uh, the NFL this year did something called the NFL 100 where they counted down the 100 greatest players of all time. And Quentin Nelson was listed as the best guard of all time after two years in football. Now, Quentin Nelson's never going to carry the ball. He's never going to catch a pass. He'll probably never score a touchdown. But he has been a big part of the Colts' success. And here's why. He understands that he just needs to do his job. Like, I just need to do my part. And that when he does his job, even if it's not flashy, he helps the whole team. Here's something he said right before the last uh, regular season game this year. He said, it's all about trusting and working hard as five, working hard as one. Like seeing it all through one set of eyes and going out there and getting our five guys on their five guys. Hey, Quentin Nelson, one of the things I love about him is he knows when everybody does their part, the whole team succeeds. You know, Moses finally understood that he didn't have to do everything. He just had to do his thing. And that when he was obedient to his thing, that God would be faithful to his thing and that would be good for everything. And do you know what? God says the same thing to you. When you, when you feel unworthy or inadequate, here's what I believe God wants to say to you. Hey, hold on to that weakness because my strength is best in that weakness. Just like Moses, there's probably something that God's calling you to do, but you're, you're sitting back, you're waiting, you feel the weight of your inadequacies. You know, if you're a student, maybe you're a high school student, you're feeling the pull to live right in high school, but you don't know what that looks like. You don't know how to do that. You don't know how to rise above the need, the desire to be popular. Maybe you majored in one thing in school, but now you feel like God's calling you to do something else, but you don't know how to go about that. You don't know what that looks like. 
Maybe you're newly married and it's hard because you want to be a godly husband. You want to be a godly wife, but you don't know what that looks like. You feel like you're being called to that, but it's different than your relationship started. Or maybe your your spouse wants to be a parent, but you don't think you're ready to be a, a good mom or a good dad. Maybe it's an opportunity to serve or lead here at Genesis or in another ministry somewhere. Maybe it's trying to live selfish or generously in a selfish world. Maybe it's a ministry you're supposed to start or a new thing you're supposed to do and God has called you and he's equipped you, but you're standing there staring at it saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. You're waiting for the day when you win the lottery and then you can do everything risk-free, right? Because that's how all great things happen. No, most important things happen because somebody's passionate about it and they just answer the call of God and they say, God, I'm gonna give you everything, my strength and my weakness and my ability and my, so my brokenness, and I'm just going to trust that you're going to do something great and amazing with it. You, you don't need to be able, just available. That's what Moses did. He wasn't perfect, but he was available. And God proved faithful through those 10 plagues. Oh yeah, the 10th plague. I told you I'd tell you about that. The 10th plague, the, the death angel passed over the land of Egypt, taking the firstborn of everything. Many firstborn males died, people, livestock, and even Pharaoh's son. But no Israelites died. God protected his people by having them put the blood of a pure spotless lamb on the doorposts of their homes. And then when the death angel passed by, um, he would pass over those homes and not kill the firstborn in that house. Now, maybe that sounds cruel. Maybe that sounds harsh on God's part. But remember who Pharaoh was willing to put to death? Not just the firstborn, but every male that was born. Pharaoh had no mercy for any baby to be saved. And with the death angel taking the life of the firstborn, God is saying, do you want to know which God I am? I'm the real God. I am the one true God. Your gods cannot stand up to me. It's time for you to let my people go. And that's what Pharaoh did. God told his people to get ready to leave for Egypt before the night of the Passover. They they were to kill a lamb and sprinkle the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of their house. And I know that sounds gruesome today, but that's a sign to the death angel to pass over those houses. And as The morning came and the cries of agony and grief started to ring out over the land of Egypt. It was a plague that no one had seen, but there in Goshen where the Israelites lived, the death angel had seen the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and passed over all of those homes. The blood they sprinkled there was a sign. It was a symbol. And the night before that happened, the meal they ate has become known as Passover because God passed over their homes when he killed the firstborns. And how were they saved? They were saved by the blood of a lamb, a perfect lamb, a spotless lamb. And then more than a thousand years later, it was the night of the Passover meal when Jesus took the bread and the cup with his disciples. He had lived a perfect sinless life and now was giving himself up so his followers could have eternal life so that they could be reconciled with God. He was bridging their tradition of Passover and showing them how he would become the Passover lamb, how he would pay for their sins and for our sins. And those of us, even today, who have been saved by the blood of the lamb still celebrate the Passover through the taking of communion. We do that about once a month here at Genesis Church and we're gonna celebrate it today. You can read in the New Testament that on the night of the Passover, Jesus sat with his disciples for a meal and he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you take it, remember me. And then he took the cup and he held it up and he said, this is my blood. It's the blood of a new covenant. There's a new agreement from now on between you, the people and God. And whenever you take from this cup, remember me. If you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to invite you in just a moment to take communion with us. If you're in the room, there are four tables. There are two in the front and two in the back. You pick up one of those cups. It's got the bread and the juice uh, there in it. If you've got If you're uh, joining us from home, you can take communion at home. I'm gonna pray for us and then you're free to go get your communion elements. Take them in your own time. The band's gonna come up and close with a song. Let's pray together. Father God, I'm so thankful for these stories that we have recorded of your people that are imperfect. They're so imperfect, Lord. We see their flaws. We, We see their scars. And you let us see those so that you can see you can use anybody. Like you can use any of us. You can use all of our inadequacy, all of our weakness, all of our flaws, all of our wrinkles, all of our scars, and you can accomplish your perfect purpose even like that. And Lord, we celebrate that. We celebrate that even in our imperfection, you sent your one and only son to make us perfect. 
that when you look at us, you don't see us, but you see your son, Jesus. You see the work that he did on the cross. You see the blood that he shed, the blood of the lamb that saves us. And we are so thankful for that, God. We celebrate that moment when you came down to earth, lived a perfect life and gave up your life so that we could have life eternal. Lord, we celebrate that through the taking of communion now. In Jesus' name, amen.